Good morning, Cherry Cross United Church. Good morning, Andrew. <laughs> well, thank you. That was much more personal than most mornings, where it's just a general good morning and welcome. Uh, we are, we're here for service today to worship God on this uh, Sunday before Christmas Eve Sunday, because Christmas Day is a Sunday as well. So it's not the Sunday before Christmas, because that would be next week. I think. How does that work? I don't know. It's your birthday. It's, that, that is also true. We're going to begin this morning with a song from the choir. We've got two songs from the choir today. And so uh, the choir is going to lead us in a song. That we've got our Christmas Eve service coming up uh, on Saturday, I think. Saturday is Christmas Eve, right? Yes. We've got a Christmas Eve service here at 7 p.m. where the choir is singing two songs and the soloist is singing one song. And then all of you are singing like 18 songs after that. <laughs> So may it not be said that we did not sing enough songs this coming Christmas Eve. And in fact, I'll probably get at least one person that says to me, Andrew, we sang way too many songs on Christmas Eve. But we're going to be singing all kind of the fav Hopefully, one of your favorite carols is in there somewhere, whether that's Joy to the World or Silent Night or... or uh, what Child Is This, or It Came Upon a Midnight Clear. I mean, those are all planned for Christmas Eve, so if you don't want to miss your carols, come out on Christmas Eve, and come out the Sunday after, which would be the first Sunday in the New Year, because we will not have worship on Christmas Day. But on January 1st, we're going to have kind of a carol singing service, and just sing a bunch of the carols to make sure we hit all of them at least once over kind of the Christmas season. So not next Sunday, but the week after January 1st, I think it is, New Year's Day. We're just going to have a, a, a carol singing service. We're just going to sing a bunch of carols and maybe look at some of the history of those carols and where they come from with maybe a scripture reading or two thrown in there as well. Because we are here to worship God and His Word is a part of, should be a part of every worship service we have. But welcome anyways to uh, church today, this morning. As we come to worship God, and we're recording as always, so welcome to anybody watching online after the fact when, when I post this. And so we'd love to know that you're watching and, and where you're from and what you're doing and, and how you found us and uh, all that good stuff. So let us know if you're online, where you're at. We're going to light our Advent wreath this morning. I had to do this a little bit differently than we've done a, the last few weeks because families are few and far between, and there also there's been sicknesses going around family, so I, I, I turned this from a family thing into a church family thing, where there is a one and an all part. So the all is in yellow, which would be all of you plus myself, and the one would be me, the one person. And it starts with a reading from Luke chapter 2, verse 19, as we read together. Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. What does love feel like in the new world? Love feels like knowing Advent is the beginning of this new world, a better world, where you and me and all of God's creation are treasured and beloved. Maybe so. Amen. Please uh, stand as you're able as we sing all of Voices United 7. We've added a verse each week with the chorus. Today we're singing the whole thing as we lit the candle that represents love. So Voices United 7, Hope is a Star. <laughs>
seated. So today, we're switching gears a little bit. We've spent a number of weeks, I think 10 or 11 weeks, going through Colossians and Philemon and looking at the, how Christ is sufficient and the many ways Christ is sufficient. I mean, we heard about strategies to advance the gospel. We talked about different virtues and vices that are like Christian virtues and vices and things that we should have as Christians in church, but also in the world around us. Last week specifically, we heard about a, a leadership model based on compassion and love. Not one based on like overbearingness or like you do this because I'm the leader kind of attitudes. And how we as a church should seek to win people's obedience, not force their compliance. And so we're switching gears a bit, finishing that series as we start to focus today a bit on the birth of Christ. Which we always focus on on Christmas Eve. I shouldn't say always, but most Christmas Eve we focus on it. But most Christmas Eve we focus on what the Gospel of Luke says about the, the birth of Jesus. And so today, being the Sunday before Christmas, I want to take a look at what the Gospel of Matthew says, what Matthew writes about the birth of Christ. Because Matthew and Luke share some different details, some things they share in common, some things they have different ways of sharing. And so we hear different aspects of the story in Matthew that we don't hear in Luke and vice versa. So we're going to talk about some of that stuff this morning as we prepare ourselves for to celebrate the birth of Christ, the reason we celebrate the Christmas season. But as we get before we get into all of that, let's pray. <clears throat> God, we ask, Lord, that you come down to us in this worship space, wherever we are at, whichever pew, whichever home, whoever we're with. God, we just pray that you come down and be with us and amongst us, that you will fill our hearts and our lives, God, as we worship you and seek to learn and grow and become more like Jesus in not only our words but our actions as well. And so God help us, give us a listening ear God and a heart to hear the message today that you want us to hear. And may my words God not be the words that I say God but the words that you want me to say as we learn together and grow and seek to become more like Christ as a community um, of church believers who just want to do better and be more for, for not only ourselves in this church, but the community around us, especially this Christmas season. So God, thank you, Lord, for Jesus and this place to worship. Thank you for everything you have given us and everything you provide. We pray all these prayers and so many more in the name of Christ our Lord who taught us to pray the Lord's Prayer together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We're going to sing another song this morning from the Voices United hymn book, the big red one, number 50, He is Born. Please join with us.
art ministry now or children's time and we need to bring the offering up to somebody one of you want to get the offering from the back or two of you and bring it forward or all of you do any of you have a cell phone do any of you kids have a cell phone at home it's kind of all i get to do is pretty much do music and do all you do coloring. you do music and coloring on the cell phone yeah you guys have cell phones no? Who here has a cell phone? Almost every single one of us. <laughs> cell phones are a, a strategy, that, a, thing, a, a device that we use to record services. <laughs> it's a device we use to connect with people and, and call people and text people and check emails, look at Facebook and social media. And, but in Jesus' day, you know what? There were no such things as cell phones. They didn't have cell phones in Jesus' day. There wasn't even lights, that's right. Yeah, all there was is just like, like wood. Right? Just wood, yeah. Like a, a fire in a, in a lamp yeah. would light things, not electricity. Yeah. So they didn't have cell phones. Can you imagine that? How did people stay connected before the age of cell phones and social media? They went to each other's houses. They, they did, they went to each other's houses. We've lost that a little bit, haven't we? Because we're so connected online, we've forgotten to stay connected in person, face to face. So God always had messages to bring to people in his day, in Jesus' day. But they didn't have cell phones, did they? So how did God give people messages? He actually, he actually, he told them, he's really quiet. He's really quiet, yeah. Sometimes God can be pretty quiet, can't he? But sometimes God sends a, an angel and a vision and a dream. And today we're looking at this story where Joseph, the, the father of Jesus, has a dream. And God tells Joseph what to do through an angel. But in today's world, if the angels had a message to share, I think they'd say something like, it's easier to be God's messengers thanks to extended phone coverage. <laughs> God would have a much easier time sharing his word with people with cell phone coverage because he could just text them. He wouldn't have to come in a dream. And so those angels are happy about God's extended cell phone coverage, which reaches all the way up to the heavens, I guess. So we're going to say a prayer as we, because we're going to talk about, not cell phone coverage, but about stories and how God might be speaking to us today and how he spoke to Joseph to tell Joseph about Jesus who is the reason we come here each Sunday and worship and the reason we celebrate Christmas. So uh, please pray with me. God, we thank you, Lord, for this offering, for these lessons, and for angels that uh, are on high and <laughs> bring us messages of glory and peace and, and joy to be born in a manger. We thank you for the offerings that have been brought forward. God, may they be used for the benefit of not only this church, but the community around this church as we seek to bless others the way, God, has, that you have blessed us. And we pray all this and so much more in the name of Christ our Lord. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. So you got, can all head upstairs for your lesson up there. And we've got another song from the choir to sing. <clears throat> so we've got our uh, first scripture reading here this morning, which... We've read it the, well, every week so far in Advent, and I've had somebody read it from out there, but I didn't print it out this week, so I think we're all going to read that together. How's that sound? Sure. All right, let's do it. A child has, has been born, born to us. us. God, God has given a son to us. He will be responsible for leading the people. His name will be Wonderful Counselor, Powerful God, Father who lives forever. Prince of Peace. For one reason or another, and I'm not sure why, the Gospel of Luke and what he writes about the birth of Christ is a story we almost always focus on on Christmas Eve. And this often leaves the Gospel of Matthew on the proverbial back burner. We don't care about Matthew, that's not the birth narrative. This Luke, that's the birth narrative. Let's read that one. So today I wanted to to look at the Gospel of Matthew and his birth narrative, and I mentioned that already earlier. So I want to spend some time on Matthew's Gospel, because he shares some things that are similar to Luke, and the similarities are important. But Matthew also gives us details that Luke does not, and that's also important. 
And people have wondered about those differences between these two writers, because they're the only two that really share the, the birth narrative of Jesus. Mark begins just basically with Jesus' baptism, and John has a whole other kind of narrative with his gospel. Matthew and Luke have this kind of Christmas story birth narrative, though. And now we, when there was a day, I remember when I was a kid, we had Christmas pageants where the Sunday school would have some sort of play or skit they'd put on. Likely you had those here at some point, right? When maybe you had more kids, larger Sunday school, more organization, different times, whatever the case might be. I remember one year I was determined to be a turtle. Because for Halloween that year, I was a Ninja Turtle for Halloween. And so for Christmas Eve pageant, I was a turtle at the major scene. Determined that there is a turtle there, too. Matthew and Luke don't tell us that, but Andrew thought as a kid there would have been a turtle there. Um, but the, the story that we often hear with, with Christmas pageants is a combination of Matthew and Luke put together. Because they share different things, and we take the story and we kind of combine them into one for Christmas pageants, and I'm never quite sure how I feel about that, because these are different people writing for different purposes. To combine the stories is, at some level, doing each story a disservice of what it, Matthew is trying to convey or what Luke is trying to convey as well. Because they're two different people, Matthew and Luke, writing about the same person, Jesus. So two people writing about one person. But they're also writing to different audiences. They're writing for different reasons, for different purposes. And that's important to keep in mind when we look at, like, well, why does Matthew share these things and why does Luke share these things? And then never mind Mark and, and John on top of that. Because there's a reason that Matthew comes first in the New Testament. Does anybody bother to guess why Matthew comes first in the New Testament? What's that? That's a good guess. That was a guess at Wesley as well. I can promise you it's not alphabetical. Because if it was alphabetical, the order would be John, Luke, Matt, Mark, Matthew. Matthew would come last, actually. And it's actually not based on how old the writing is either. Because Matthew's actually considered one of the older Gospels written, not one of the more like recent ones. And I mean that in terms of Mark is the oldest one. Mark was, is generally thought to be written somewhere between, I think, 30 and 60 years after Christ, whereas Matthew is like 80 to 120 years. So if we're going by order of, of writing, Mark would probably come first, and then Matthew and Mark and John would come sometime after that. So it's not based on how old or new the records are either. The reason that Matthew comes first is, is it's really a logical and a theological reason. It's because Matthew's writing for a Jewish audience. Matthew's purpose in writing is to share to a Jewish audience about Jesus. And so I think when they were putting the New Testament together, their theological thought was, who's the best person to make the transfer from the old covenant and the old ways in the Bible as they knew it to the new ways and the new covenant and, and things of Jesus' day now? Because everything changes with the birth of Jesus. And so when they put the Bible together, I think they looked and saw, well, Matthew's writing to a Jewish audience who knows the scriptures. So Matthew's first because that's the audience he's writing for, is a Jewish audience. And so it's more likely, I think, that Jews of, of Matthew's day would recognize Matthew, would, would take credit, credit his writing for what it is, and say, yeah, you know what, there's something here. I'm going to dedicate my life to Christ now. And they kind of, for lack of a better word, convert to be a Christ follower. Because Matthew quotes from the Old Testament more than every other gospel writer does. So that's how we know and, and scholars believe that Matthew is writing for a Jewish audience. That's one of the things they use, because he quotes from the Old Testament so often. Whereas Luke writes for a Gentile audience, a non-Jewish audience. Luke's gospel is written for you and I. I don't think any of us are Jews or were Jews in the past. If you were, then I didn't know that. That would be new information for me. And so maybe that's why we share Luke's gospel on Christmas Eve, because he's writing for people like us, whereas Matthew's writing for people that are Jewish <laughs> and have a different background. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with either way. But keep all that in mind as we get into the gospel of Matthew and what Matthew writes in chapter 1 to the people about the life of Jesus. Because chapter 1 begins with Jesus' genealogy. 
Again, Matthew's writing to a Jewish audience, so he starts with the genealogy. This is how we know Jesus is the Messiah, and he lists the names. And it includes quite a few females as well as males, which wouldn't have been all that common in his day. And it's a really fascinating genealogy. I mean, you could do an entire sermon series on the names in that list alone. The genealogy of Christ. What a, there we go. There's, there's what we'll talk about next week. <laughs> but Matthew starts at verse 18. Um, our, our reading today starts at verse 18, after, which comes right after that genealogy. And this is what Matthew writes. <laughs> this is how the birth of Christ came about. His mother Mary was engaged to marry Joseph. But before they married, she learned she was pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because Mary's husband, Joseph, was a good man, he did not want to disgrace her in public, so he planned to divorce her secretly. <coughs> so as far as Matthew tells us here, Mary is the mother of Jesus. She's engaged to be wed to Joseph. They're to be married. But that marriage event hasn't happened yet. Mary has become pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Joseph doesn't know that, though. He just knows that she's become pregnant. He didn't get the Holy Spirit part yet. <laughs> so Joseph was a faithful Jewish man, of course. But he was also a respectable man. He wanted to obey the Jewish laws, but he didn't want any harm to come to, to Mary. And so his plan was to leave her quietly. I'll, I'll, I'll leave her quietly. It won't be public. Nobody has to know the details. Because there was a punishment in this day for being pregnant out of wedlock according to Jewish laws. And that punishment was death. It was stoning. Not, not, a, not a nice way to go. By this time in history, though, who's ruling the, the Jewish area, the Israel? The Romans are. The Romans are in power at this point in history. And the Romans actually control who gets the death penalty and who does not. They don't let the Jews take care of that anymore. That's the, the Romans say, nope. We're the governing rulers. We're going to tell you who you can and can't kind of stone or kill or things like that. So if Joseph were to leave Mary publicly, she probably wouldn't be killed, although that would have been the customs and the laws of the day. But she wouldn't have been treated kindly by people, by the community around her, by the people she loved. She probably would have been ostracized by her community and the people that she loved because, well, she got pregnant out of wedlock, which was a big deal for Jews in that time period. And, and for some, it still is. For some Christians, it still is as well. Joseph, though, does not want anything to happen to Mary, anything bad. And so his plans are, well, I'll leave her privately. It'll be quiet. Nobody has to know. It's not going to turn into a spectacle because I'm a faithful man, but I'm also respectable. So, I want to be kind to her, despite what's happened. The story continues over verse 20. But while Joseph thought about these things, an angel of the Lord came to him in a dream. And the angel said, Joseph, descendant of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because the baby in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sin. So Joseph considered his future actions, and he had made a decision on what he was going to do. Before he enacts that plan, though, and gets the, the gears rolling and the tide going, an angel of the Lord appears to him in a dream and a vision and, and tells Joseph that he must take Mary as his wife because the baby inside of her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. The angel tells Joseph that Mary will give birth to a son. They're to name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And this is where I think one of the more significant differences between Matthew and Luke happens. Matthew is focused on Joseph's experience, whereas Luke is focused on Mary's. When we read the Luke narrative, we very much get Mary's experience of the birth story. Whereas for Matthew, we get much more focused on Joseph. That's not a reason to doubt the story, though. I don't think, though some people say it is. But it serves as a reminder, I think, to consider who the author is writing to and what their purpose of writing is. And so the story continues in verse um, 22. All this happened to bring about what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be pregnant, she will have a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the Lord's angel had told him to do. Joseph took Mary as his wife, 
but he did not have sexual relations with her until she gave birth to the son, and Joseph named him Jesus. So the agreement here between Matthew and Luke, let's get into that a little bit. The agreement between them is that there's a couple who's to be married, but they are not married yet, and their names are Mary and Joseph. They agree that they both tell us that Mary becomes pregnant by the Holy Spirit and has not had sexual relations with anybody, and so he, she has not cheated on Joseph or betrayed his trust in any way. An angel reveals in both stories, I think, that the child's name will be Jesus, and, and even explains why here. But there's, a, there's the differences as well. Because there's no mention of shepherds here, is there, in a field, and an angel appearing to shepherds. That's a Luke thing, and we don't hear about that in Matthew. But Luke leaves out the flight to Egypt and the visit of the wise men, which comes in Matthew chapter 2, which we're not reading today, but comes after the fact that it's often included. We include wise men in our Christmas plays and pageants often, and we get that from Matthew. The main points of the story are shared, though, and I think that's the important thing to consider. That the major points, the major focal points of the story are shared. And that this baby, Jesus, is a special child, and there will never be a baby like him before or after. There's something significant going on here. Mary and Joseph, though, probably don't know the whole story, do they? How many of you know your whole life story and what's coming in the future? How many of you want to know? <laughs> Probably not, right? Like, there's, there'd be some harm if we knew when we would die and how. We'd probably act very differently. And I don't think that would be a good thing in many instances. So Mary and Joseph, they don't know the whole story. They don't know what's going to happen over the next 33 or so years of Jesus' life. But they really don't need to know. Those details don't matter to them as, as parents at that point in time. Although we might say, well, I'd love to know when my kid's going to go off the radar or be a troubled child or become a teenager and rebel against everything I've tried to teach them, because that would be really good to know so we could try and counteract it before it happens. But we don't get to know those details. As far as Joseph is concerned, because the angel has told him this, Mary still has been loyal to him. She has not betrayed him. And so the child will be given the name Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And this is kind of the a question I want us to consider and to think about this morning. Is there a difference between the right thing and the loving thing? Like, is there a right thing to do and a loving thing to do? And can they sometimes be different things? I think a lot, sometimes it's the same thing, right? And loving, okay, well, that's what I'll do, that's easy. But sometimes I think there's a difference between the right thing to do and the loving thing to do, in terms of our actions. And I think the right thing can be different than the loving thing. And that's what we kind of see in this narrative from Matthew is that Joseph knows what the right thing to do is, but instead he chooses to do the loving thing, even though it's not technically the right thing. Because again, in Joseph's day, the right thing to do when a woman became pregnant with a baby that was not yours was to leave her. And some might even say that's the right thing to do in today's world. But in Matthew's day, it was also right to publicly disgrace that person for, for what they have done and being pregnant without, and it's not yours. But that was not the loving thing to do, was it? It's not loving to leave somebody that, well, you love. <laughs> it's not loving to publicly disgrace somebody because of their actions against you. And so Joseph knows what the right thing is, but he chooses the loving thing. Even though it's not technically the right thing to do. First of all, to not publicly disgrace Mary. That's a loving action from Joseph. But to also decide to stay with her. I mean, granted, there's an angel approached him in a dream. So he, he chose the loving thing. He didn't have to, but he does. And so sometimes there's a difference from this story. And I think we see it in, in, throughout Jesus' life as well. There's a difference between the right thing to do and the loving thing to do. Jesus often chooses the loving thing. I think almost always, probably. Jesus chooses the loving thing, which may not be the right thing from a strictly religious standpoint, but it was a loving thing to do, and that was what mattered. Joseph likewise chooses the loving thing to do because he has a dream where an angel of the Lord tells him what he should do. He's told the appropriate action. And there's this comic strip series that I've shared them before. It's uh, AgnesDay.org. They have a series of comic strips where, where, that usually contain two sheets. 
And they, they had one that I found this week based on this very reading. And it says, I totally envy Joseph. And you do? I would love to have a personal angel to tell me what God wants me to do in a tough spot. But you've got one. You just never listen to my advice. <laughs> a funny take on the story, but I think also a true one. Maybe you've never had a vivid dream like Joseph does, where you're told what you should do in a tough spot, what the loving thing to do is. Maybe, though, just maybe, your friends and your family around you are there to act in that capacity. They're there to be that proverbial angel in your dream or angel on your shoulder, telling you the right course of action in a tough situation. Maybe listening to outside voices other than our own is kind of the point of this story to some level. Because then we can know not only the right action, but the loving action. And hopefully those things are the same thing, but that won't always be true. Listening to the people around us is an important part of making decisions, especially tough ones. And so as a church, I think we, as individuals, should listen to the people around us. But as a church as well, we should listen to the people in the community around us. And so some questions to consider when listening to others. What is the community around us saying and asking in Charing Cross or in Blenheim? How can we as a church answer the questions they're asking? What are they? Because I don't know what those questions are, but maybe you do. What are the people around us struggling with who aren't here this morning? Not even why aren't they here, where are they, but what are they struggling with? What are their hopes and dreams? What do they put their faith and trust in? If we begin to answer those questions, we can begin to reach them as a church. Because then we're listening to them. Then we're hearing what their concerns are. We're hearing where they're at in their faith journey, wherever that might be. If we as a church want to connect with people that aren't here, because you're all here, so you're connected, but people that aren't here aren't. We need to reach people in the community where they're at in their journey, not where we think they should be. By asking those questions, by figuring out what they're struggling with, maybe why they're struggling with it, and how we as a church can help that struggle, can help answer the questions they have about life or faith or even money or philosophy or like whatever questions people around us are asking. Those are the questions we should be seeking to answer as a church. Because then we'll become relevant to them, because we're dealing with the things that they're concerned about, while also maintaining a, a scriptural basis and a focus on Jesus, of course. But if we need to reach people where they're at as a church, not where we think they should be. And I think a lot of times we, reach, we try to reach people where we want them to be, not where they're at. And so I'd say be a little more like Joseph over the next couple of weeks, and going into the new year as you celebrate Christmas with your family and your friends. Listen to what those around you are saying. Listen to what people around you are asking. And then tell me what you hear so that we as a church can start to fill the roles of that sheep that gives people advice and helps them along the journey if they would just listen. <laughs> but we can't know what they're asking unless we first listen. They can't listen to us if we don't first listen to them. So listen to people over this kind of Christmas season. Figure out what their hopes are, what their dreams are, what they're struggling with, what their questions about faith and life and all that stuff is. And then we can determine as a church how we can best fill that role so that we're relevant and that they're like, hey, you know, there's something to this faith thing. Because they're answering the questions I'm asking. I want to be a part of that. We need to meet people in the community where they're at, with their needs. Let's pray. <clears throat> Help us, God, this morning and all days, God, to know the difference between the right thing and the loving thing, because those will not always be the same thing. And when presented with a choice, Lord, may... You help us, God, to, to choose the loving thing to do because that is what Jesus chose in his ministry, even if it wasn't always the right thing to do, but it's the loving thing to do, and I think that is what matters most. 
And when we're faced with a tough choice, God, help us to know which choice is the correct and loving one. Help us, God, all, help us all to listen to our friends and our family, those around us, because they will have good advice to give when we're presented with a tough situation and a tough decision to make. Help us, Lord, as a church, to listen to the community around us. Listen to their wants and their needs. Listen to their questions that they're asking, that we as a church might be the church that they need us to be and want us to be, even if that's not necessarily the church we think we should be. It's the church the world around us needs, God. And so may we be the church that people can come and seek to know you more in the best way as they know how and the best way as we can, can help lead them on that journey and teach them and grow with them together. We lift up in prayer, God, all those who are sick and hurting, all those in hospitals and long-term care homes, and especially we pray for Richard Finn and his family today, God. We pray, God, for healing, where healing may be brought. We pray, God, that you will work through the nurses and doctors and hospital staff to um, bring some care and compassion for, for Richard and his whole family during this moment and this time. We pray, God, for the community around us, that they may see our example, God, and want to join in with us to worship you. And as we prepare for Christmas, God, and just next week is Christmas Day, may your name always be to us, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace, and Savior of the world. And prepare our hearts, God, for the coming of Christ, whose birth we celebrate and remember every Christmas season. And may we remember, God, the reason that we celebrate is it's not presents, it's not family gatherings, it's those are all part of it, but that's not the main point. The main point of Christmas, God, is that you have sent your Son to us, Jesus, God with us, Emmanuel who will save his people from their sin. May we be reminded of that every, every day this week and every <laughs> for the rest of this calendar year as we celebrate his birth in just about six days now on Christmas Eve. We pray all this, God, and so much more in the name of Christ our Lord. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. We've got our song to sing, wonderful Counselor, which we've sang the last uh, few weeks and are singing once more as we conclude our uh, Advent season um, with this song. And then come January, we'll have a new song to sing every week for a month or so. So, uh, but yeah, so join with us as you are able as we sing Wonderful Counselor. Thank you. 
sure that when this service is available online, you go like it and leave us a comment so we know you're there. If you want to be added to our email list or prayer list, please let me know. Or if you know anybody that does, also please let me know. The Blenheim Ministerial Carols in the Park, if you want to go ahead there, Kevin, is uh, tonight. That's tonight, I believe, December the 18th. There will be some uh, hot drinks and dessert and some sort of treats, I think, uh, being shared by the Blenheim Community Funeral Home. And uh, it says to please dress warmly. And I don't know who's leading the song or how that's working, but come join us for some carols in the park led by the Blenheim Ministerial. And then one more slide for our Christmas Eve service, which of course is this coming Saturday, I believe, at 7 p.m. here at Cherry Cross United Church. So be here or, or don't be, but you should be here for Christmas Eve. Bring your friends, bring your family. It's, it's the first year since really the pandemic started that we've been able to have a full-fledged Christmas Eve service without restrictions stopping us or like only being allowed so many people in the building and this, that, and the other thing. So it should be a great celebration. We'll be recording that as well and posting it online after the fact, though, if you're not so sure about being in a building with potentially upwards of 200 people in here. Everybody comes as they often do for Christmas Eve. So there will, there will be options. But it will not be live streamed, it will be recorded similar to what we've been doing and then posted after the fact so you won't be able to see it probably until the next day or two after Christmas Eve. Uh, any announcements or news from the community? Anything that I've missed? Just a reminder, there is no service here next Sunday. Yes, no service here next Sunday being Christmas Day. Um, the church decided that they didn't want to come and hear me preach on Christmas Day, so they're giving me the day off. <laughs> or they're giving me my birthday off, whichever you want to go with. Your choice. Um, but we will be here on January 1st. We'll have kind of a carol hymn singing service, singing a bunch of the carols that people know and love. So we'll have a lot of those on Christmas Eve and more on January 1st. So if you don't hear your favorite carol by Christmas Eve, come on January 1st and hopefully you'll hear it then. <laughs> Beyond that, let's sing our uh, closing song from Voices United number 46, Gentle Mary Lane. Her child. Please stand as you're able as we sing.